Congress. Mr. Robles is not in the courtroom every day, um, and although he is uh, trying to um, have all of his drawings cleared by your uh, representative, he's not been able to connect with her on all occasions, and perhaps that is how one of the drawings was broadcast without someone else in the court seeing it. It certainly was not done intentionally. But he has brought all of the drawings, so if you would, uh, could identify perhaps for him which one in particular was the one that you saw recently. All right, well, counsel, what I propose to do is enter a formal order to both your client and all sketch artists who were involved in this case that their drawings be submitted to the public information officer for approval by the court prior to broadcast. And the court, you know, as you know, uh, Ms. Hazlett is present here in the courthouse every day. And this court rarely leaves the courthouse before 6 in the evening every day. So we'll be available to, in, a, in an expeditious manner, review any drawings uh, that you want to use immediately that day. That would be fine, Your Honor. I think the problem has been there are deadlines, and uh, Mr. Robles does not do his work here in the courthouse as the other sketch room artists do. I believe they work up on the 12th floor. They perhaps have a little closer access to Ms. Hazlett, whereas Mr. Robles retires to the CBS trailer to complete his drawings, and I think that's how they've missed each other. But Well, if you if want, what we can do is set up a regular schedule at the conclusion of business. will be available for, say, half an hour after the conclusion of business every day, or... Uh, we can be available uh, just before the start of the afternoon session for other deadlines. I, I guess we'd have to have both in the instance that if there's a drawing that we need to use in advance of the evening news, it would need to be cleared before the close of session that particular day. Um, if there is a drawing that we don't need to use, then yes, we could have it cleared at the end of the day. All right, then I'll, I'll issue this order and I'll direct uh, Ms. Hazlett to set up a regular schedule uh, where she, she and the court will be available uh, at the conclusion of each court session, both in the uh, at the conclusion of the morning session, conclusion of the afternoon session. Is that acceptable? That would be fine, Your Honor. All right, then that'll be the order. All right, thank you, Counsel. Thank you. Newfeld, people represented by Ms. Clark, Mr. Darden, and Mr. Goldberg. The jury is not present. All right, let's have the jurors, please. Your Honor, we have uh, a number of matters that need to be resolved before we take Mr. Matheson. Um, I'm wondering if you want to do that now. Yes, perhaps we should. Hold on to the jurors. Mr. Blazer. Uh, there are several matters. There's the, the ruling on the serology chart. All right, I received uh, letter briefs from counsel on both sides with regard to that issue. Mr. Blazer, do you have any further comment you wish to make on that issue that is not included in your letter brief? Well, the, the people just filed, at least they handed me an unfiled copy of uh, further paperwork on this just this morning. I don't know if the courts had a chance to review this or not. I was handed something and told that it was going to be resubmitted. No, I, and, then I, and then I said that we were not. There was only one type, there was one type I corrected in hand and then dated it. Uh, so the court All right, Mrs. Robertson, would you grab that off my uh, desk? As I understand the argument in this new paperwork, uh, the people are taking the position that there should be no testimony about the EAP B results of the uh, blood under Nicole Brown Simpson's fingernails on the basis that they're now saying that unless they can testify about these other in inconclusive results, this now becomes an inconclusive. And uh, that argument makes no sense to me, first of all. I'm not sure how to respond to it because it's a senseless argument. There are a number of statements You mean in to say it's a contradictory argument? Thank you. Never mind. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, both. I mean, there are other statements in this, uh, this brief that are just flat not true. They talk about how... Um, the uh, typing results for the pool of blood under Nicole Brown Simpson shows a banding pattern uh, consistent with a type B, and they say that this result was called an inconclusive B. Uh, I would like to have Mark, uh, Mr. Matheson's report on this. Yes. Yes. If you will look at page two of this report, you'll see that item number 42, which is the, uh, the blood under Nicole Brown Simpson, 
Mr. Matheson concluded that it was an inconclusive. Not an inconclusive B, but an inconclusive. Uh, if you look also at the blood on Nicole Brown Simpson's thigh, which is item number 85 A and B, in this brief they just filed, it's described as an inconclusive BA. In Mr. Matheson's report. Number 85? Yes. In Mr. Matheson's report, it is an inconclusive. It is not an inconclusive BA. The, you'll also note that the fingernails, which are items 84, A, and B, are not inconclusive at all. They are a B, a straight B. And uh, to represent otherwise is just simply not scientifically correct. Now, they may try to explain, well, it sure looks like a B, but maybe it was a BA at some point in time, and we're prepared to deal with that particular argument. Uh, but to call these, to change these other re results to say, well, they were inconclusive before, but now we need to make them something else, is just simply uh, scientifically fraudulent in our view and should not be permitted. So we would uh, uh, submit the matter with those comments on this brief that they just filed, as well as what I've already submitted in my brief before. Mr. Goldberg. It would be scientifically fraudulent not to admit them, and that's why we <coughs> felt so strongly about this and have uh, in insisted uh, uh, on this uh, to the extent that we have in, in filing a number of points and authorities and uh, making a, a variety of, of arguments. Uh, we would like to call Mr. Matheson in a 402 hearing because we do believe that when the court understands these issues and they're not, it's not immediately apparent why the prosecution is taking the position that we are and why the defense is taking the position that they are. In fact, there's a certain aspect to it that's counterintuitive because if you just look at the results on their face, the EAP result of the pool of the victim's blood being an inconclusive B is inconsistent with the defendant and is inconsistent with the victims in this case and would seem to lend a theory that someone else deposited it. So you would think that the defense would be seeking to get that result in, that the prosecution would be seeking to exclude that result, because why would we want to put on a result, an inconclusive, albeit an inconclusive one, that's inconsistent with anyone in this case? Why would the defense want to exclude that result? It does seem to be counterintuitive, but, but when the court understands that scientifically, we know that the pool of the victim's blood has to be her blood, and therefore we know that the true type is a BA, and we know that that's not what we see when we test it. That tells us something about what is happening under the environmental conditions at the crime scene. And it tells us that type EAP BA blood is degrading in such a manner as to create the appearance of a, of a B. And, and I think Mr. Matheson can communicate this to a way in the court, to the court that I cannot. And that's why we would seek to put him on uh, for the purposes of, of explaining this and perhaps using a chart that we have that we'd use with the jury to explain what this banding pattern looks like when it's not degraded what it looks like when it is degraded, to explain the scientific literature that identifies this problem that we quoted in our most recent brief, and to discuss the literature that says that, that according to some analysts, you are required as a forensic scientist to look at the pool of blood and blood on the victim's clothing as a control study to determine whether or not you in fact have degradation on this one particular marker because it has certain problems in terms of degradation that the other markers do not have. And we've cited the literature which says that Mr. Matheson is required, according to these authors, to do the precise thing that he is doing and that he should not, if you uh, accept these authors, express an opinion about the blood under her fingernails unless he's also looked at what's happening in the pool of blood and the blood that's on her clothing or on her person. Now, counsel has given you a copy of the uh, analyzed evidence report, which says, which simply reports inconclusives. It does not give an indication as to whether it's an inconclusive B or an inconclusive BA or, or, or what have you. 
On the electrophoresis worksheet, which in, in light of Council's um, argument, I should probably also mark, uh, only unfortunately my copy has writing on it. I'd like to give the court a clean copy. Do we have it? clean copy to mark, but it talks about the uh, EAP result on item 84 A and B, which are the fingernail scrapings, and 85 A and B, uh, which are the, which uh, are the, uh, the dots of blood that came from Nicole Brown's thigh. And the way that it is called on the electrophoresis worksheet, which is the one that is done contemporaneously with the testing while you're actually looking at the plates. The analyzed evidence report is a formal document for external purposes, for attorneys and for the court and so on. But, but in what is actually a, a uh, document that is generated at the time of the analysis, what Mr. Matheson says on 84A and B, th that being the fingernails, is B question mark. And the question well, mark typically. Mr. Goldberg, let me let's let's cut to the chase here. Let's assume that as a result of this challenge, the court needs to conduct a 402 hearing. What's your time estimate as to how long that'll take? And I how do you and how do you suggest we accomplish this as expeditiously as possible? Understanding we have a jury. I understand that, Your Honor, and and I don't like 402 hearings, and I don't believe that 402 hearings should almost ever be done with, with live testimony. So this is not, this is contrary to my, my ordinary practice because I understand what the court is afraid of here. And that is that it's going to turn into a little bit of a mini trial on an issue where the prosecution feels that there is no factual or legal issue for the court to resolve. The, the bottom line conclusion that Mr. Matheson is going to give is that based on the totality of the evidence that he has in front of him, that the EAP results under the victim's fingernails are in fact well, a BA. I, I asked you two specific questions. How long is this going to take and how do you suggest we do it? The way I would suggest it is, is this. Council has raised an objection to the people's chart. They haven't tried to limit the scope of Mr. Matheson's testimony or somehow force him into giving an opinion that is scientifically unsound or that is contrary to, to what he uh, believes as a forensic scientist. So what I would suggest is this. If the court still has a problem with the chart itself for some reason, after looking at the people's brief, and the court believes that it would be helpful to hear more about this issue, then Mr. Matheson should simply be allowed in front of the jury to testify to this result, to other results, to how he's interpreted them, to the, the forensic science literature and what he believes the literature requires in making this kind of an interpretation, and his bottom line opinion. And after that, I think it will become clear to the court that, that the chart itself should come in as well as summarizing what is actually placed on the electrophoresis worksheet. Because the electrophoresis worksheet does in fact provide that 85 is a BA question mark, or an inconclusive BA. And, and, and all of our, our results on the chart do in fact come either from the electrophoresis worksheet or from the analyzed evidence report. So it's a summary of business so records. Are you, are you suggesting that I conduct this 402 hearing in the course of the presentation yes. of Mr. Matheson? Yes. I've heard that before. Mr. Blazier? Well, we certainly object to that. And let me make it clear. We're not objecting to Mr. Matheson testifying as to how a BA degrades and whether it can look like a B or not. We're fully prepared to cross-examine him on that issue. What we're objecting to is him testifying that in inconclusive results are anything other than that. And the analyzed evidence report that he prepared was prepared after the worksheets and were based on their observations of the worksheets. This is the report he submitted for the uh, attorneys and the court and for everyone else who wants to know about them. These are the results that he called. He called them inconclusive, and we object to him testifying to anything other than that. All right. Thank you. 
All right, the court finds that this particular issue as presented is an issue that goes to the weight of the testimony, the weight that is accorded to the testimony, not necessarily its admissibility. However, having said that, the court anticipates that we're going to see rather extensive cross-examination as to this particular issue. And uh, I have to indicate to uh, counsel for the prosecution that given Mr. Matheson's original report, I suspect I'm going to have to give rather wide range to the defense uh, as to these, quote, inconclusive indicate, indicating a degraded sample. All right, let's have the jurors. Yeah, there are other issues as well. Such as? Uh, the prosecution uh, just brought in a new chart this morning on this very issue of the fingernails, and we have no objection to anything on the chart except there is a picture of uh, Nicole Simpson's body from a, a long shot that I think it, it may have been used before in some other context, but it has no meaning really on this particular chart. We, we think it's uh, overly gruesome and unnecessary. Mr. Goldberg, will you get to that chart before we break for lunch? I don't anticipate that I will, but it is, it is possible. All right, let's assume, let's assume that we're not going to get to it. I'll take a look at it over the lunch hour. But I, I believe I'd it like is, to get rolling with the okay. jury this I way. believe it is a photo that's been introduced. And, and then counsel also had another motion has that they to, filed has to have some this morning. So. But what? I'll look at it over the lunch hour. Yeah, we did have okay. an additional motion that Mr. Newfeld is prepared to argue that we filed this morning concerning the order of proof. Uh, in essence, we're objecting to Mr. Matheson testifying to any test results on Mr. Simpson's blood before they call uh, without proper foundation of the person who drew the blood. And Mr. Newfeld is prepared to... Well, I assume I'll hear that objection as soon as there's some testimony regarding the blood, a foundational objection. And finally, there was a brief filed on uh, Thursday, I believe, about the business records exception and... Uh, regarding chain of custody. Regarding yes. chain of custody. We have no objection to testimony from Mr. Matheson about what amounts to ministerial acts of putting things in packages and sending them off to other labs. But we would object if they have any intention of uh, offering testimony about Mr. Matheson testifying about tests that some other person did or evidence collection that some other person did under that exception. Uh, but I, I understand from Mr. Goldberg they don't intend to do that, so that may be a moot point. I don't have a present intention of doing that, Your Honor. Terrific. Glad to hear it. Let's have the jury. And finally, um, we would object in advance to avoid a, a sidebar, if possible, that uh, if they intend to ask Mr. Matheson any questions about anything that our experts have done, either at some other location or in Los Angeles, we object to that and want to be heard about that before that's done. All right. That seem, would seem appropriate. Mr. Goldberg? Uh, I do have a present intention of doing that, Your Honor. This, and, uh, this morning session? I don't think we're going to get to it this morning. Okay. Give me a heads up when that comes so we can uh, discuss that out of the presence. Let's have the jurors, please. Rejoined by all the remaining members of our jury panel. Previously in chambers, the court conferred with counsel. The court has found good cause to excuse from further service juror number two. Mrs. Robertson, would you please draw a uh, number of an alternate juror to take seat number two? Juror number 1427, can you please have a seat in seat number two? All right, Mrs. Robertson, at the uh, noon break, you'll uh, renumber the seats and provide court and counsel with a revised uh, jury chart. Yes, sir. All right, Mr. Goldberg, would you call the people's next witness? Yes, people call Gregory Matheson to the stand. Raise your right hand, please. Gregory Matheson, G-R-E-G-O-R-Y, M-A-T-H-E-S-O-N. Mr. Goldberg. Sir, what is your occupation and your current assignment? 
I'm employed by the City of Los Angeles, working for the Los Angeles Police Department Crime Laboratory. I am currently what is called a Chief Forensic Chemist One, which is Assistant Director of the Laboratory. Okay. And sir, in that capacity or in any other, are you part of any conspiracy in this case to frame the defendant? No, I am not. Or a part of any uh, cover-up and, and for the purposes of framing the defendant? No, I am not. All right. Now, you said you're the chief forensic chemist? Yes, that's the title. And what, why is it called that? <clears throat> well, that's the civil service class that was assigned to that position a while back. It exists in two-step. The chief forensic chemist one, which is an assistant director position, and the chief forensic chemist two, which is a laboratory director. All right. And uh, how many chief forensic chemists are there in, in the crime laboratory? Well, there's a total of three, one director and two assistants. Okay, I'm going to get into your training experience in a, a few moments, but did you perform some of the conventional serological testing on some of the biological evidence in this case? Yes, I did. Right. And, and also, did you participate in um, uh, managing the uh, sending of, of items out for analysis to outside laboratories? Yes, I did. All right. Now, <clears throat> do you have a uh, degree that qualified you to uh, become a criminalist at the Los Angeles Police Department? Yes. And what was your degree in? Well, I have a degree in criminalistics from California State University at Long Beach. When did you get that, sir? Was in May of 1977. And I want to ask you about some of the other courses that you took since then. Um, do you have your uh, curricula vita in front of you? Do you need to refer to that to give us specific dates and times? Yes, I do. Okay. All right, Mark, to reflect that Mr. Matheson does have before him a uh, ring binder with a number of pages in it. Sir, since you uh, graduated in 1977, have you taken a, a fairly large number of courses uh, in furtherance of your training and experience as a criminalist? At that point, it depends on what you mean by courses. I have had a, a handful of what I'd call formal uh, training or courses along with a, attendance at a number of seminars and, and meetings and that type of thing. Okay, I just want to go through some of the courses and seminars that are uh, pertinent to the, the issue of serology. And let's start with the 1982 uh, two-week FBI class. What was that about? Well, in 1982, I took a two-week course called Biochemical Methods of Blood Stain Analysis that was offered at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. Uh, that was uh, mainly about the electrophoretic determination of genetic marker types. It's the steps or the process that's used to in what has been called conventional serology to identify the types of enzymes that are present in the body. Okay, and just so that we're defining some of these terms, uh, when you say conventional serology, that is distinguished from what? That term came around as DNA analysis in forensics started becoming uh, possible or, or used within the field. It, in a way to define the difference, uh, we started calling the systems and techniques that we'd used for many years as conventional and the rest is being DNA. And when you say electrophoretic techniques, we'll, we'll get into this in some more detail further down the line, but can you just give us a, a simple definition? Well, electrophoresis is a process or a technique whereby uh, a gel is poured, samples of biological material is placed on one end of it, uh, electrical current is passed through it, and the end product is a sequence of bands that can be interpreted to tell you what type of blood you're looking at. And were these techniques, the electrophoretic techniques and ABO type testing around for a significant period prior to the use of DNA technology? Yes, they were. Now, in uh, 1987, did you attend the serology symposium? Yeah, there, with a collection and preservation of evidence? There was a symposium held at that year which involved attendance by a large number of uh, forensic scientists, uh, mainly in the California area. 
I, I did attend it, however, I was also one of the working groups or met with uh, one of the committees for several months prior to that in preparation of the meeting. Uh, the area that I in, was involved in was standards of training. Okay, and what was the focus of this particular symposium? Uh, the focus of that symposium, which was uh, to elicit what was the standard practice or the consensus of practice within the forensic community at that point in time. In terms of what? What we were calling conventional serology. Did this deal with any of the collection and preservation aspects or just the, the testing aspects? No, it also involved a, a collection and preservation. And was there any product that was generated as a result of the symposium, such as a manual or a pamphlet or publication? There was a uh, kind of a loose covered document that, I don't know the number of pages, it, it's about a quarter inch thick. All right. And did that cover the, the subjects of the collection preservation and also the conventional testing? That's correct. All right. Now, w was a lot of uh, focus placed at this uh, serology symposium into the mechanics of how you actually collect a stain uh, from a crime scene? The actually getting down on your knees and... Right. It, no, it didn't go into uh, uh, that aspect of it very much at all. And do you know why? The only reason that I... Well, you, you were part of this working group? No, the working group I was in dealt with training. Okay. Has the actual mechanics of how you collect a stain been a controversial issue or a, a, a widely discussed issue in the forensic field? No, it is not. Why not? Because it's, it's a fairly basic uh, process. Uh, even in reviewing a number of forensic tests, there's texts, there's very little reference to that step. They talk about locating the stains and eventually then, you know, packaging and preserving them, but the actual collection uh, is not addressed very often. Now, going back to some of the courses that you took, in 1989, <coughs> did you take a, uh, a, I guess, two classes at the University of New Haven, Connecticut? Yes, they were held at the university. However, they were, you know, it wasn't like a university course, but it was held at that facility. And uh, can you tell us what the two classes were? Well, one of them dealt with the uh, ABO typing of bone samples, and the other was an overview of DNA. When you say ABO typing, you're referring to what? Well, that is, uh, it's a fairly common, what we call genetic marker. Uh, it's what, matter of fact, it's a, the genetic marker that most people are aware of. You are either a type A, type B, type O, or type AB, and that's a system that hospitals usually use when they're uh, cross-matching blood for transfusions. Is that also used in blood banking? Yes, it's what's commonly referred to as your blood type. Okay, uh, how long has that system been, along, been around? I believe it was originally uh, identified at the turn of the century, uh, 1900. So one of these courses dealt with, um, was it just ABO typing of, of uh, bones or also, or did it also deal with electrophoresis? No, that was strictly ABO. Okay. And what was, and you said the other course had to do with, uh, with DNA yes. techniques. And what, what type of DNA techniques did that deal with? I believe it was mainly about RFLP, but we also spoke a little bit about the PCR technique. And those are two of the, the uh, techniques that are used in DNA typing? Yes. And was this uh, course instructed by a leading advocate of using uh, DNA technology in forensic cases? Sustained. Okay. Did, was the person that taught this course in favor of using DNA technology in forensic setting? Well, actually, it was taught by several different people. They brought in uh, several different speakers to talk on the different subjects. But uh, yes, most of the people that were there were there because they uh, believe in the technology. And was there any uh, <coughs> particular um, individual that's uh, prominent in the forensic field that taught this course? One of the uh, people that was involved in both setting the course up and presenting it was a Dr. Henry Lee 
which is the head of the Connecticut State Crime Laboratory. Okay, and, and does he uh, advocate using or support using DNA technology in forensic cases? Sustain. Okay, well, w w did he actually teach some of the courses that you, or one of the courses that you attended? I believe he was involved in presenting some of the information. All right. Did he appear to be a supporter of using DNA technology? Yes, he did. Now, in January of 1990, did you take a two-week course uh, relating to DNA technology in um, forensic cases? Yes, I did. And where was that course held? That course was held at, uh, in Denver, Colorado at the Analytical Genetic Testing Center. What did the course, uh, how long of a period of time did the course last? It well, covered two weeks. The first week dealt with uh, this technique I mentioned before, RFLP typing in general, the basic background to it uh, involved in actually performing some of the tests. The second week focused a little bit more on the technique that was used by the FBI. Okay. And then in June of 1990, did you attend some training at the University of New Haven and Cetus Corporation? Yes, I did. Uh, what was that training? That was a course that was offered by the Cetus Corporation, which I believe at the time was a manufacturer of the PCR kits that were being used for forensics. And it involved the uh, theory and practice and techniques in PCR analysis, along with some hands-on getting a chance to run the uh, techniques ourselves. Okay. And uh, how long was that course? I believe it was five days. Now, in addition to these uh, courses that we just mentioned, did you attend seminars of the California mm -hmm. Association of Criminalists? Yes, I have. And when did you start attending those seminars? Well, I became a member of the California Association of Criminalists in 1979 and attended every seminar I could go to. Uh, from that time till now, I believe they're held twice a year, and I think I've only missed three or four over that time period. How long are those seminars? Normally the last two and a half days, a full day Thursday and Friday and half day on Saturday. What range of topics do they cover? Just about anything to do with forensic sciences. Do they deal with uh, serology issues in, in these seminars? Many times uh, serology is one of the main topics of discussion, uh, both in the papers that are given and outside of them. And, and by the way, what is serology? Serology deals with the analysis of body fluids. Okay. Now, uh, and you said that these, court, that these seminars by the California Association of Criminalists are twice yearly? That's correct, once in the fall and once in the spring. And as a result of uh, attending these summer seminars, do you uh, learn the practices that are standard within the criminalistics profession? That's part of it. The, like I said, the seminars have a wide range of topics from uh, techniques that may be used in the future that are just becoming uh, available to us to hints and tips on how to do, you know, current techniques better and just, you know, generally kind of dealing with this, you know, the topic in, in general. Are the forensic scientists who attend these seminars coming only from California or do they come from other places as well? No, they can come uh, from just about anywhere. As a matter of fact, our last meeting, which was held in the fall, was done in conjunction with the uh, Forensic Science Society from England, and we had a number of attendees uh, join us from England. Okay. Now, is there also an organization known as the American Academy of Forensic Sciences? Yes. And uh, are you a member of that organization? Yes, I am. Do you attend their seminars? I have attended about four of them, yes. And uh, how long are their seminars for? Well, they tend to, the, the actual papers or technical presentations are basically the same as the CAC, CAC meetings, or the California Association of Criminalists, in that they're about two and a half days. The meeting itself can run anywhere from six to eight days because there's an awful lot of, you know, ancillary type of activities that go on. 
And is that, uh, are those seminars along the same line as the California Association of Criminalists, or do they differ? Well, in that they cover a lot of different areas of forensics, they're the same. They are significantly larger, though, because that's a national organization, and it's composed of not just criminalists, but forensic pathologists and odontologists, you know, dentists, and you know, a lot of different areas in forensics. And each of these specialties are meeting you know, at the same time in different areas of the same facility. So when you attend one of these meetings, do you, do you go to all of the present presentations or just the ones that are involved in your area specialty? Well, you can't go to all of them because a lot of them are running at the same time. I, I try and not just stay with what I've spent most of my time with, and that's serology. I like to you know, attend all those that seem interesting or appropriate, but also get out and get some exposure to some of the other areas. And as a result of attending these meetings, do you also get an idea of the standards and practices that are being used in the forensic community on a um, nationwide basis? Yes. All right. Now, y you mentioned this uh, manual that was generated uh, from the serology uh, symposium. But other than that, have you had the opportunity or have you had time to publish papers yourself while you've been working at the Los Angeles Police Department? I uh, who will? I have never personally published uh, any sort of scientific paper. And why is that? Well, normally, uh, an awful lot of the papers that appear in scientific journals and that type of thing deal with research. Uh, validating existing systems, bringing new systems online, uh, that type of thing. Uh, my interest has not been in research. I enjoy applying the technology. I've always enjoyed do, doing casework. And a mere fact of the fact that we're with the Los Angeles Police Department and our criminalistics laboratory has a very high caseload. There's a, you know, unfortunately a lot of crime in the city. And it does keep us busy just doing casework. So it's a combination of the two things. I've, I don't have a strong interest to get out there and publish and do that, and I enjoy doing casework, and there's plenty of casework for us to do. When you say casework, you're referring to what? Anything that comes into the laboratory associated with a crime or incident within the city of Los Angeles could range from uh, the type of casework the laboratory gets runs the gamut from narcotics to serology cases associated with homicides and rapes to blood alcohol analysis, uh, just about anything. Okay, let's turn a little bit to the, your professional career. Um, when you were in school getting your degree in criminalistics, did you work for any law enforcement agencies? Yes, I did. W what agency did you work for? For the Culver City Police Department. And in what capacity did you work for the Culver City Police Department? My title was a community service aide, and then it got changed to community service officer. Basically, it was a student position. It was part-time during school, and uh, then full-time during uh, vacations and holidays. I worked a couple of different assignments. I was with them for about five and a half years. Initially, I was assigned to patrol, where I'd go out and you know, assist with uh, booking prisoners when they came in, take burglary reports, simple things. Occasionally, you have to write par uh, parking tickets, that type of thing. I eventually, actually, as soon as I could, got transferred out of that area into our identification unit because that interested me more. And in that unit, I learned how to process a crime scene. I'd fingerprint uh, burglary scenes, photograph scenes, go out and fingerprint and uh, I photograph whatever type of crime scene we, that happened to come up. Now you said identification unit. What's that? Well, normally, I. Crime laboratories tend to exist only in the larger cities, counties, state, you know, federal government, that type of thing. Small municipalities, as a rule, do not have crime labs. They have what are called ident sections or identification sections. They focus in on evidence collection, uh, fingerprinting, and photography. When you were working with the um, identification section at the Culver City Police Department, were the people that you were working with criminalists, or, or did they have some other job classification? Well, we're talking about a small department. The, the person that I worked directly with uh, would be another civilian. It happened that the two people that I worked for, they were ident identification technicians. Uh, they were both retired, one from the Los Angeles Police Department as a uh, fingerprint person, 
and the other uh, was retired from the LA County Sheriff's as a fingerprint person. But did they also do things like collect biological evidence or was it limited to fingerprints and the like? No, if there was a reason, if there was a crime that involved uh, biological stain or evidence, uh, either they or I would, uh, depending on who handled the particular scene. So they were collecting biological evidence even though they were not criminalists? That's correct. Okay. Is that standard throughout the uh, state in terms of the way law enforcement agencies or many law enforcement agencies collect biological evidence? Sustained. Well, sir, are you aware of the standards and practices in, in a variety of law enforcement agencies as a result of your participation in these various state and uh, national organizations that you've testified to? I am aware that the uh, personnel that are used to perform different tasks varies from agency to agency. And do uh, some agencies use criminalists, whereas others use uh, technicians, identification technicians? Yes, that's correct. I mean, in the case of the City of Los Angeles, we have criminalists. We do not have ID techs or identification technicians, so we use criminalists to collect that. Like I mentioned, many smaller municipalities that don't have crime labs have their ID techs collect the evidence. And actually, there are some cities that have their own crime lab that also hire ID techs that are the ones that go out and process mainly the simple scenes, but process scenes. Okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> when did you first join the Los Angeles Police Department as a criminalist? It was in June of 1978. And by the way, are you a sworn personnel as a criminalist? No, I am not. I, our criminalists are civilian. Okay. Now, when you uh, first joined the Los Angeles Police Department in 1978, what was your first assignment? Well, I was hired in as a criminalist one, and I was assigned to the toxicology unit. And how long were you at the toxicology unit? I worked toxicology from June of 1978 until I believe it was early January of 1980, so approximately uh, 18 months. What was your next assignment after you were finished in toxicology? Okay, after working toxicology, I was transferred to what we call a special testing unit, and in that unit, I dealt with maintaining a couple of analytical instruments, I run, running some of the more unique or unidentified drugs or narcotics, uh, bomb debris analysis, uh, poisons analysis, variety of different things. So what does special uh, testing do in terms of, I mean, do they just test anything and everything that, that's unknown or, or what? Well, our, with the way our laboratory is laid out, the special testing unit has some specific assignments, such as any sort of bomb residue case, a poison case, that type of thing, go directly to that unit. Beyond that, basically, the, the people that work that unit get whatever doesn't fit into any of the other units. It's uh, things that make handle some sort of unique or special handling. Okay. And, and you were there for 18 months, you said? Uh, actually, it was a little longer. I believe it was from January of 1980 until I think it was August of 81. So it'd be about 20 months. All right. And where did you go after you were finished with your assignment and special testing? After that, I was assigned to serology. And uh, how long were you assigned to the serology unit? Well, as a... Uh, criminalist two or doing bench work uh, would have been until uh, I believe it was May of 1988 when I was promoted to uh, what was called a crim three then, which was our supervisor position. Were you a supervisor in serology initially? Yes, I was. Okay. Now you, you used another term. You said bench work. Is that the same as case work or, or different? Yeah, that's a, a term that's used for the person that's actually sitting working on the evidence, doing the analysis. is called bench work. Okay. How long uh, have you been a supervisor at the Los Angeles Police Department and the crime laboratory? How many years? Well, actually, I, I probably should have referred to my notes before. Uh, it was May of '89 when I was promoted. So it'd be from May of 89 until uh, October of 94 that I was a supervisor. So when you were first a supervisor, were you supervising anything other than serology at first? Well, my unit was serology. I was also a member of one of our special field response teams 
that goes by the name of the Forensic Accident Investigation Team. That was formed uh, while I was a Crim 2, myself and two other criminals were assigned to this. It was a, a special assignment to go out and collect evidence from uh, specialized crime scenes, mainly those that were uh, vehicular related homicides, hit and runs, that type of thing. Uh, when I became a supervisor in May of 89, I was supervisor then of serology plus of this team that I was on. And when you initially became a supervisor and you were supervising this team in serology, did you still play an active role in the bench work that was going on in the unit? Yes, I did. Right. And uh, in addition to that, did you also uh, have any function in terms of reviewing reports and confirming results and the like? Yes, as supervisor of the unit, one of your goals is to, or jobs, is to review the analytical notes that come out of the criminalists or the analysts that are working the units before a report can be submitted out. Uh, we want to have it reviewed by a supervisor and uh, either signed as being uh, complete and accurate or returned to the analyst for uh, either correction or updating, whatever it would require. Were you performing any function in terms of actually reading other people's electrophoresis plates or photographs of the plates? Well, actually, for the first, oh, three plus years of being supervisor of the unit, I was still doing casework. Obviously, it wasn't at the same level as I was before, but I was still a uh, analyst within the, the laboratory. In addition to that, these electrophoresis uh, plates that I previously described with the bands on it, they were always co-read, either by the original person that did the run, plus then somebody else that was following up on it. Didn't have to be a supervisor, it could be a co-worker. I, I continue, as a matter of fact, to this date, still continue to uh, occasionally co-read plates. Okay. Now, approximately uh, six months ago, did your position within the crime laboratory change? Yes, it did. And what did it change to? Well, in October of 1994, I was promoted to my current position of Chief Forensic Chemist 1, and I currently manage what's called the Forensic Analysis Section of the Crime Laboratory, which includes not only serology, but other units such as our Trace Analysis Unit, uh, Chemical Processing Unit, which does fingerprints in-house, our Firearms Unit, a Valley Unit, and Question Documents. And are you still uh, performing bench work in this capacity, generally speaking? No, I'm not. All right. Uh, are you still performing work in terms of looking at other people's electrophoresis plates and co-reading them? Occasionally. It is not near as often as it used to be, obviously. But if uh, the, somebody has some work that's been completed and they want it reviewed and there isn't anybody else available in the unit, uh, for whatever reason, then they have come and asked if I'd go back and, and do a co-reading on it. Are, are there any plates that only you are qualified to uh, read or that you, are, that you have to read in the laboratory? There is one system that uh, uh, called haptoglobin that I, I tend to co-read more than anybody else. I don't know if anybody else. At How do you this spell haptoglobin? H A P T O G L O B I N, I think. And why is it that you tend to co read that more than others? Well, everybody has their own interests when it comes to a particular system or something within the unit. One of the criminals that works the unit now uh, is the one who runs them the most, and she and I have worked together with it on the past. So I tend to read them for when she has a, uh, one of these come available. Uh, I haven't done it in, I think it's probably been a month or month and a half, so either she's not running that system as often or somebody else now in the unit is trained in co-reading. Okay. Now, uh, with respect to some of the professional organizations that we um, asked about, uh, is there also a, an organization called the American Board of Criminalists? It's the American Board of Criminalistics, yes. Criminalistics. And what is that organization? That is an organization whose function, actually sole function, is the certification of criminalists on a national basis. And did you play any active role in that organization? Yes, I did. What was that? I was involved in forming it. I, I believe it was in 1987 or 88. Uh, a group of people was called together and I was one of those who was invited to attend as a guest because I had some experience in cer a certification program. 
uh, meeting held back in Chicago. And out of that meeting, uh, eventually was born the American Board of Criminalistics, uh, a incorporated nonprofit organization. And I, uh, like I said, I was part of that original planning group of it. And then for the first two years of its existence, which I believe was from February of 90 through 92, I sat as the vice president of that organization. And when you say that this was involved in certifying criminalists, what, what does that involve? Well, the process of certifying somebody is that you want to know or have some sort of indication that they possess the basic skills, you know, minimum skills and knowledge to be able to perform their job. And in criminalistics, there was a lacking of a system like this, particularly on a national basis. Uh, so what we did is, in establishing this organization, gave the professional criminalists throughout the country a body with which they could apply to, take a test, uh, do proficiency testing, uh, these type of things, to be able to demonstrate that they have the minimum uh, criteria necessary to do this type of work. And what type of... Um showing does a person have to make or a criminalist have to make in order to get the certification? Well, there's actually a couple different levels of the certification process. Uh, to be what, in the American Board of Criminalistics, to be what's called a diplomat, you have to have, I believe it's two years experience in forensic sciences. You have to pass a written examination that uh, is on general criminalistics, not in any one particular field. Uh, and uh, be working in the field, actively working in it. And do you have that? Yes, I do. Now, is there also an organization known as the um, California Association? Well, we talked about the California Association of Criminalists. And you said you joined in 1979? Yes. Um, did you hold any sort of positions within that organization other than just being a member? Yes, I have. And uh, in, in 1987, did you uh, begin to hold a office in that organization? Well, 1987, I, I was made the chair of the certification committee. Uh, at that time, the California Association of Criminalists was interested in starting the certification program, actually before the national effort began. And the first step towards doing that is putting together a committee. Uh, I was the first chair of that committee when it was formed, I believe it was either in January or February of 1987, and uh, held that position until the program was actually up and running and we were testing people and offering certificates. Right. And did your status in that organization change in approximately May of 1990? Yes. In May of 1990, I was appointed to the position, uh, a board of directors position called the Regional Director South. Our association is basically divided in north and south, and I sat as that, on that position on the board of directors for one year. And then in May of 1991, did you run for uh, president of that organization? Yes, I did. Actually, it's, you run for a president-elect. Uh, it's, it's a three-year commitment. The first year you're president-elect, you sit on the board. It's a board position, kind of learn the job. The second year is as uh, president of the association, the third year then is the immediate past president where uh, you still stay on the board, have an active position in it, but it gives you a chance to wind down and assist the, the current president. And did you serve in that capacity for those three years? Yes, I did. So then your term ended in May of 94? That's correct. Do you continue to serve on any committees or any organizations within the California Association of Criminalists today? Yeah, at the moment, I currently belong to two committees. One of them is a publication committee that is involved with putting together our newsletter, and the other is a financial review committee. I, I would, have, would have liked to have been more active on it, but I've been a little busy lately. So I, I, though I belong to them, I haven't been as active as I'd like to be. And uh, are you also a member of the um, California Association of Crime Lab Directors? Yes, I am. What's that? That's an association that I don't know what our current membership is. I, I think it's probably in the 80 to 90 range that's made up of managers and supervisors of crime laboratories, mainly in California, uh, but we also have members from other states. And uh, while you were working in the serology section of the Los Angeles Police Department, can you give us an estimation of approximately how many ABO types, ABO tests you performed 
during that period of time. I'd like to, I, I didn't memorize those numbers. I, okay. I did make myself up a kind of review chart of the type of tests and the quantities that I did. Okay, during the course of my, my career in serology. Hold on in, just a second. Let, let council review the chart that you're reviewing. Sure. Referring to. In the area of ABO typing, I, I estimated that I've done approximately 6,500 of those type of tests. Okay. And approximately how many electrophoresis tests have you performed on uh, something called PGM subtype? That would be, uh, it was approximately 1,000. Okay. Now, I'd like to ask you a little bit about um, crime scenes. Have you had any uh, experience in actually going out to crime scenes during your uh, uh, professional career at the Los Angeles Police Department in processing crime scenes yourself? Yes, I have. And approximately how many crime scenes would you say that you've processed? Uh, my best guess uh, is about 150. I didn't have real good statistics on that, but that was my best estimate. I think it's conservative. Have you ever um, rigged up any mock crime scenes for, for training purposes? A couple, yes. Right. And when you attend these seminars at the California Association of Criminalists and the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, do they uh, cover to some ex do they cover crime scene investigation as, as some of the topics in those seminars? Sometimes they do, yes. Have you trained any people within the Los Angeles Police Department? Uh, in terms of crime scene investigation? Yes, I have. H have you trained any people outside of the uh, SID section of crime scene investigation techniques? Yes. Uh, who would that be? Well, I am, have been one of the instructors in a couple of our detective training courses that we offer. Uh, one of them is the Sexual Assault Detective School. Uh, they obviously focus more in scenes and evidence collection related to sexual assault. I also have taught for a couple of years at our homicide detective school, teaching them on the uh, division's capabilities, SID's capabilities when it came to crime scene and simple evidence collection techniques. I also teach at a detective supervisor school and we touch lightly on field techniques. When you say evidence collection techniques, have you ever taught detectives how to collect a stain using LAPD's procedures? You're talking about a biological yeah. stain? Yes, I have. And why are detectives taught that? Well, I, we want the detectives to be able to have the capability of collecting biological stains, blood drops, that type of thing, if a criminalist isn't available. Though we do have an on-call system where a criminalist is available to be called out any time of the day or night to assist with evidence collection, uh, we're not always called. Sometimes the uh, scene may only have one or two drops or one or two items, they don't feel it's necessary to call us, but that's still evidence that we want to have captured for later analysis. So we have been for, I believe it's the last at least six or eight years, uh, training homicide detectives mainly on the proper techniques for collecting biological evidence. We supply them with a blood collection kit, which is simply a file box with the tools that are necessary in it to collect those samples. And are, are they taught how to, you know, take a control and use the distilled water and use the tweezers and the whole nine yards? Yes, they're uh, both shown in a demonstration form. We, we talk to them about it. Uh, it's demonstrated to them. And if time permits, we have them uh, practice it within the class. And are detectives, in fact, collecting biological evidence in the Los Angeles Police Department and submitting it to your laboratory for analysis? Yes, they do. Now, does the uh, Scientific Investigations Division also have a field unit? Yes, we do. And is that, who supervises that now? Well, right now, the unit is, they have a lead criminalist, or what we call a criminalist three, that's in charge of that unit. Uh, that person also works in another unit. Uh, our trace supervisor is the immediate supervisor of them, and then I manage it. 
Now, uh, why wasn't the field unit assigned to processing the evidence or collecting the evidence in this case? The deciding who ends up processing a scene is, is mainly a function of what time the call comes in. Like I mentioned a few minutes ago, we have people that are on call, criminals that are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I, however, if a call comes in during working hours, normal working hours, which for our field unit is 7.30 to 4, Monday through Friday, rather than send the off-watch person who may have been up the night before or may be going out the following night, we send somebody from this field unit to do the evidence collection. Are, is the field unit, are the people assigned to the field unit necessarily more ex experienced in crime scene processing than the individuals that are uh, criminalists who are on rotation? No, not necessarily. They can be. Our field unit consists only of Crim 2 individuals or those people that have advanced to the point where they, they could handle a crime scene by themselves if they had to. I, however, they, we rotate people through that unit just like we rotate people through our off-watch on-call situation. So if, uh, in this case, the, the evidence shows that there was a Bronco search that occurred on the 14th during the daylight hours, why would the field unit not respond to that as opposed to Mr. Fung and Andrea Mazzola? Well, what we try and do is maintain some consistency throughout uh, a particular case. If it's possible, I, the person that handled a scene, say the night before or week before, if some sort of follow-up occurrence occurs, like a car search or an additional scene, we want the same people handling it that handled the original scene. So in that case, that's why we did not send out somebody from the field unit. Would you always have to, if, if you had two criminalists that responded to the first scene on day number one, will you always send the same two criminalists to the second scene or, or can just one or the other go? No, we can. It depends on the circumstances. Uh, we can just send one of the team uh, or if neither one of them is available, we will go and send somebody from another part of the laboratory. But is there any rule that if you use two on day one, you have to use the same two on, on day two? No. Right. And uh, typically within the Los Angeles Police Department crime laboratory, do you always send two criminalists uh, to investigate a crime scene? We try and get uh, two people out to a scene whenever possible, yes. Are, are there instances where only one is sent? Well, we make an evaluation as to the complexity of the scene. If it appears that it's going to be something very simple, uh, maybe a simple car search or something involves you know, going to a tow yard and doing an examination, there are times where we will send only one. But I, we believe two people can do a better job. And was there ever any uh, management decision that was made not to send Andrea Mazzola out to subsequent, certain subsequent scenes after the 14th? Overall. As far as, I mean, there, there obviously are decisions made when somebody is sent or not sent. So in that case, it was. There has never been a decision made that said she will not handle any more scenes, no. Well, that, that's what I meant. There was never a decision like that. That's correct. So if on a subsequent scene you only, because of the complexity, needed one person, you would send one person out? That's possible, yes. Now, um, in this particular case, uh, before testifying, have you watched some of the uh, proceedings or heard some of the proceedings uh, on television or on the radio? Yes, I have. And have you heard some of the testimony and seen some of the testimony relating to the crime scene processing? Yes, I have. And did you also speak to me about the testimony that you were going to give? Yes. What were the nature of those discussions? Mainly it was, it was a two-way thing. I, I was in preparing you uh, for what I was going to be testifying to, uh, just as you would talk and tell me some of the areas that we were going to discuss. Uh, normally it is just acquainting each of us with, with styles and with general topic areas that are going to be uh, brought up during direct examination. Did you also provide me with some instruction in terms of how ABO typing and electrophoresis is performed and certain technical uh, topics such as that? Yes, that was part of you know, my comment about preparing you for it. Uh, there has been kind of a training process going on to acquaint uh, both 
uh, or to acquaint you with uh, a, uh, the techniques and the procedures that we use. Have you also talked to any uh, defense lawyers and given the, uh, provided them information about the case as we progressed? Yes, I have. Okay. And is um, there any rule within the LAPD Crime Laboratory with respect to talking to defense lawyers? I mean, how does that work? The only rule that we have deals with discovery materials, and that is, is that uh, if items are going to be released to the defense, that the prosecu prosecutor's office is aware of it, and that if it isn't your own work, that the original criminalist is aware that these informations are being provided. Uh, beyond that, there is no specific rules about whether, you know, who you can or cannot talk to I mean, with regards to a case. Do you talk to defense lawyers? Yes, I do. And uh, is it common for criminalists to speak with the person that's going to be calling them as a witness prior to getting on the witness stand and testifying? Yes, and it's not only common, it's preferred. We want to make sure that everybody understands you know, what's going on, that you have a chance to, to discuss the issues. Let's get a little bit into the issue of uh, collecting evidence. First of all, what does it mean from a criminalistic standpoint to collect evidence at a crime scene? Well, collection uh, involves everything from documenting where the evidence is, uh, describing the item of evidence that's to be collected, the actual process of picking the evidence up off of the ground or off of whatever item it might happen to be, uh, eventually uh, packaging it and describing it for a property report, and then what's called booking it in or placing it into our property facility. And uh, when evidence is collected at the, by criminalists at the Los Angeles Police Department Scientific Investigations Division, do you use some sort of form in the field for the purposes of doing that? We have uh, actually a couple different sets of forms. One of them that I believe is called a crime scene checklist and the other is a vehicle search checklist. Do you have that? I wanted to show you uh, Defense 1107 for identification. Ask you some questions about that. Page, it's the page, Your Honor, that uh, is in table form, or chart form, I should say. Can you see, is the resolution good enough so that you can see that, Mr. Matheson? I can see it, I can't read it. <laughs> But I can see what it is, and I recognize what it is. Okay. And is that one of the pages in the crime scene identification checklist? Yes, it is. And is this page uh, typically filled out contemporaneously with the evidence collection, or with certain phases of the evidence collection? Most of the information is. Some of it is filled, a bit, filled out later on. Well, in terms of the, the, the numbers and measures, are those done at the time? that the uh, measurements are actually done or shortly thereafter? Yes, I would expect it to. The item number along with uh, a kind of brief description of what it is, such as red stain, coat, whatever it happens to be, along with the location of where it was found, the, you know, if it was on the street or on a bed, and then measurements in the room or location if, if that's appropriate. Now, are there any strict rules uh, in the Los Angeles Police Department laboratory with respect to how this form is to be filled out? No, there isn't. And do you have a, a function now in um, reviewing these forms after they come back from the field? Yes. Now, with respect to um, the photo ID number column, or ID photo number, actually, excuse me, it just says ID photo. What is that to be used for, generally? For me, I have always considered that a checkbox as to whether or not a photograph was taken of a particular item out at the scene. Sometimes it doesn't happen, either photogra photographer's not available or uh, whatever. I and mean, that's been the place where I see, yes, a photo was taken, check it off. Have you noticed any other practices? I believe that there have been a couple people that use that as an indication of maybe a, f 
um, alternate number location if there was a different number used or something. I, I'm aware that, that people have different interpretations of what that column means. And is, is there any requirement that you have to check off everything in that column? Not at this point, no. Okay. Now let's move the form over a little bit. And what about the buy column? What is that to be used for? Uh, my understanding of that is that's a spot where you put your initials, the, the person that was involved in collecting the evidence. What if you're working in a team? How is that to be used? Well, in the same way, if uh, I, you have a couple of people out there and for some reason it may be important at some point to know who picked it up, it would be nice to have the initials of the person that was involved in it, but uh, is not necessarily required. And if you're working in a team and both people saw a particular piece of evidence uh, collected, is there any standard practice with respect to whether you say the person that physically picked it up, its initials should go in there, or both people's, or how's that handled? No, we currently don't have consistency on that. Okay. And what about the time column? How do you use the time column personally? Normally, I use the time column to bracket things. Uh, if I'm going to be many times in the, in the situation of picking up evidence, you go through and you locate the evidence, have it photographed, you put your numbers down, have it photographed with the numbers, uh, do your measurements. You kind of work in groups of, of items in, say, a particular vicinity or locale at a scene. What I would do is record the time of the first item in a group that I pick up, a rough guess as to what time it is, you know, look at my watch or something like that, and then I'd record the time of the last item in that group and just run a line between them. Uh, sometimes I don't even record that information on this form. I've also been known to write it on the packaging or the envelope and then come back and fill that information in later. So if you had 10 items, you would know in that particular group, you'd know when the first and the tenth were collected with some specificity? Uh, roughly, yes. And then everything else would just be an arrow between those two, day, those two times? A line, yes. Do other criminalists use that in the uh, Los Angeles Police Department? Yes. And are there other practices that are used? Well, there are some people that record the time for each and every item that they pick up. Okay. Now, uh, from a uh, serology standpoint, if you're talking about a stain that was collected at, let's say, 11 o'clock, and then a second stain that was collected at 11.15. Is there any forensic relevance to knowing that one was at 11 and the other one was at 11.15 generally? Objection. Well, is there any significance from a serology standpoint to the time difference? No, there isn't. Now, within the uh, forensic community, based upon your membership in these various organizations that you've discussed, are you aware of any consistent practice with respect to uh, when you are working in a team investigating a crime scene, whether you should signify who physically collected a particular piece of evidence, whether you should separate it out? I don't remember having any discussions about that. That is not a hot topic within the forensic community? No, it isn't. All right. W what about the issue of, of the times? Is that a hot? I'm sorry. Did you locate that item? Iris Goldberg, proceed. And what, what, what about with respect to the portion uh, of the list that says time or notating the time? Does that appear to be a controversial or uh, hot topic within the forensic community as to how you should fill that kind of information out? Not in specifically how it should be filled out. All right. 
what is the goal that is um, the criminalist is trying to achieve in generating this paperwork? I mean, why do you even have to bother with it? Well, the main reason is to be able to locate where the items came from. Uh, the most important piece of information that is on there, or the sequence of information that exists on that form, is the item number, the location where the item came from, and a description of the item itself. That way you can track that item through the system. Uh, many of the other items that are on there uh, are nice to have, you know, but the most important thing are those three items, the number, the location, and a, a brief description of what it is. So do those three items help you to place a particular piece of evidence back in the crime scene? In other words, figure out where it came from specifically? Yes, it, well, it relates back to the photo that was taken of it, so you can see a picture of it, how it was at the scene, and gives you a, a location of, you know, in general where it was. But if you have a photograph, is it absolutely necessary to even have this kind of information? I mean, isn't it duplicative to a certain extent? Well, to a certain extent, but not completely. Photographs are not perfect in their uh, depth or their perception as to where they are. It's still nice to have, you know, measurements to generally locate it where it is in relation to other items, in relation to a room, or in relation to a victim, something like that. Okay. Now, is there any rule within the Los Angeles Police Department as to whether this form can be filled out in pencil or pen or any other writing instrument? No, there isn't. And with respect to erasures, is there any rule on that? No, there isn't. If the form is uh, a mess to the point that it's difficult to read, uh, can the criminalist rewrite it? Are we talking about the whole form or portions of it? There's no rule that says they can't rewrite or clarify uh, certain areas of a document. Maybe we can just look at the next page, 18 and 19. This is also 11.07, Your Honor. Have you seen this, taken a look at this document before? Yes, I have. For instance, on, on this document, if you wanted to clean it up to place it in numerical order, and uh, because some of, some of the items appear to have been erased and written over, is there any rule that would prohibit you from doing that? Objection. Oh, well, but we have gone over this well, but previously. Yeah, but uh, it's something that the defense has made a, a lot of but we have gone about. through it. We've discussed it. You can get his perspective as a manager, but I think we've about covered it. I know, and it's just one right. question on this, and one we question. spent about an hour on it during the defense Our case. Well, wait, counsel. Okay. One question. Proceed. Okay. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> I hope I don't get in trouble. Um, with respect to, to this type of form, if the criminalist wanted to clean this up because there are erasures or just to put things back in numerical order, would there be any rule against that? There would be no rule with them rewriting it uh, from an administrative point of view. I'd like to have the original still thrown in with the notes, but uh, if it made things clearer to rewrite things or reorder them, that would be fine. But is there any written policy or oral policy on that one way or the other that you're aware of? No, there isn't. Now, you said that part of your function is to, um, uh, currently as a supervisor, is to review, thank you, the crime scene identification checklist when they come back. Do you, did you do that in this particular case? Did you review these? Well, as the, when I was supervisor of the trace and, or serology unit, I also at one point was given the trace unit. One of my duties did involve the review of field notes as it related to crime scenes. These were not reviewed uh, prior to their photocopying and uh, distribution. Why was that? It was mainly a function of 
the hecticness of the time, uh, we were involved both in this case and along with many other ones that go on constantly within the city. Uh, Mr. Fung does not work directly in our facility. He's in one of our satellite locations, and he had the notes with him for a period of time. And it was just a matter of circumstances that by the time we got copies of the original ones for distribution, they had not been reviewed at that point. And who was supposed to actually review those while you were the trace supervisor? Was it supposed to be you personally, or did you have someone under you? The normal process would be the notes would be left in a box in our trace unit. Uh, they'd be initially reviewed by our lead or the CRIM-3 of the field unit, and then he would give them to me with the recommendations of uh, either filing them because they're complete or uh, suggested things to, to advise the criminalist on uh, when it came to maybe making them more complete prior to filing. And did you have a CRIM-3 of the trace unit at the time that this case was, uh, at the time that Mr. Fung and Ms. Mazzola went out and investigated the crime scenes? Yes, I did. Okay, was he at that time reviewing them or were you doing it? It was, we were both doing it. He was, he was reviewing uh, the majority of them, but uh, I was also involved in that. Okay. And what is the purpose of reviewing them at all? Well, it's kind of a twofold purpose. One of them we are looking to see if they're complete or as, as complete as possible, that they have recorded things like uh, field tests that were performed, uh, that uh, mainly that, that they were as complete as possible. If there were areas that were left undone, we would send them back to the criminalist, and if he had that information available, we would ask them to, to make them complete. If they didn't have it, or you'd have to just, you know, make guesses on the information. We didn't want that. Uh, at that point, it becomes a training process in that we point out to them, next time maybe you should put a little more detail here. You should, you know, make sure your measurements are all included, whatever it happened to be, so that the next time they went out in the field, their notes would be, be more complete than they currently are. So on occasion, you will ask someone to actually add something to the crime scene identification checklist to add some additional information? I will if I am sure that they know that information, that they're absolutely positive and they're not just putting something in there to fill it in. And other than that, it's, it, the review process serves a training function? That's correct. Right. Now, um, on the uh, crime scene identification checklist in this case, there's been some uh, testimony that Andrea Mazzola was placed on as the officer in charge on the Bundy list. I'm her, her name. I'm aware of that, yes. Yeah. And is there any significance to that? No. Why is that done typically? What does that signify? Well, the OIC or officer in charge, just normally by habit, is the person who is on call. Officially that weekend, Ms. Mazzola was the criminalist on call. When Detective Headquarters Division, which is the section of our department that dispatches us, uh, has a homicide scene where a criminalist is requested, they go to a sheet that we supply them on every Monday and Friday and refer to the, the name of the criminalist that is available. And the name appearing on that sheet was Ms. 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 Mazzola. Uh, she then, because of the fact that she was a crim one, would call the crim three that was responding with her, the supervisor, in this case, Mr. Fung. So it, it merely was an indication of the fact that it was her weekend on call and her name was placed on top. And that is how it's typically done? Is that what you're testifying to? Yes. All right. Now, with respect to um, collecting evidence again, do you have a practice in where you're talking about biological evidence of collecting representative samples? Yes. What does that mean? To me, a representative sample is well, probably the best way to do it is by, by a uh, example. If you have a blood trail that leads away from a scene or into a scene or whatever, if you have a blood trail that consists of 30 or 40 drops that goes on for a block or two, uh, it would be unnecessary and inappropriate to pick up every single drop of blood along that trail. Because you can tell by looking at it that it's a continuous trail being dropped by the same person. Uh, what we would like to see, rather than picking up all 40 of them and spending the time doing that, is to pick up what we call a representative sample of that trail, a blood sample from the beginning, maybe one or two in the middle, depending on how long it is or more, 
and one from the end. I would also expect somebody that's doing a trail like that to collect any sample that appeared that it was out of place or not consistent with the, the trail. That's my definition of what a representative sample from a crime scene is. And uh, what about in a situation as, as in a car like the Bronco in this case? Do you have to collect every last stain in there or do you take a sample of them? How, how do you do it? It depends on uh, the quantity of blood that's present. If there are a number of stains that are grouped together, uh, then I would say no, you probably are not going to collect every single one of them. I would expect somebody that's doing a car search would pick up samples from different areas within the vehicle that represent the possibility of different blood samples coming from different individuals. And is, what is the purpose of, of taking representative samples in situations like the ones you've talked about as opposed to just collecting every last stain that's there? Well, uh, we deal with realities when it comes to resources. Uh, we have only a certain number of people that are available to collect evidence and a certain number of people to analyze evidence. And at some point you have to be practical. You have to decide that you're spending too much time picking up one of every one of these 20 samples where that time could be better spent evaluating other parts of the scene, uh, getting the samples packaged and ready to go. And then ultimately when it comes to the serology unit, uh, they are not going to analyze all of those items as a rule anyway. They are going to have relied on the scene, person at the scene to pick up the, the best samples, the ones that will be most representative of the crime and the people that were involved. And it's, it's the best utilization of the resources so that we can get as much uh, provided for the people of Los Angeles as we can with the resources that we have. Can you judge how well a criminalist has uh, done in terms of processing or investigating a crime scene with biological evidence by figuring out the quantity of stains he or she collected? No. We have had some people that collect very few but always seem to find the most probative samples. And we have had people in the past that collect many, many samples but uh, don't always give us the best information. When you say most probative, you mean what? Ones that answer the questions, ones that uh, uh, if there's multiple people bleeding at a scene that we are getting blood from multiple people and not just from one. Uh, whatever it's necessary to get the most appropriate or the best information out of the evidence that's left at the scene. Now, um, is this idea of using selectivity in uh, collecting evidence one that is discussed in some forensic science uh, literature? Yes, I'm aware of it being discussed elsewhere. And specifically, did you uh, look at the discussion of this idea in Henry Lee's book on uh, crime scene identification, the one that I always refer to as uh, Henry Lee Child Edition? I have seen that information in this okay. book, yes, that you need to uh, be selective in the samples that you, you collect. And, and uh, I'd like to just show you a... Um, one portion of this book and see whether you've taken a look at it. It just has big print. That's the big print book. You, you recognize it? Yes, I do. Yes, child. What? Referring to the page. Referring to the size of the print. Referring to the size of the print. It's big print. It was my idea of a joke. But anyway. um, You're obviously not at the age where you need bifocals. Yeah, that's, well, I'm getting there. You may. And directing your attention to page 79, the uh, first full paragraph. Maybe you could just read, did you, did you, have you considered that paragraph? Have you read that before? Yes, I've read it before. And maybe you could just read what, what uh, Dr. Lee says about collecting evidence where it starts recognition and, well, maybe just starting there through the rest of the paragraph. Recognition of evidence involves selectivity and a general understanding of logic of crime scene. If all objects at the scene are collected and submitted to a forensic laboratory for further analysis, the forensic facility will be overwhelmed. 
If critical evidence is omitted or improperly preserved, the use of sophisticated equipment cannot salvage the investigation. Hence, correct crime scene search and collect collection methods are of paramount importance. Okay, so basically it's a balancing act between not wanting to overwhelm the laboratory with too much and not wanting to miss the relevant evidence. That's correct. Now, with respect to the uh, Bronco, well, I'll get into that later. Uh, have you um, heard some testimony to the effect that in this particular case that there were five stains at the Bundy location, all of which were collected, whereas there were three stains at the Rockingham location, A, B, and C, that were not collected? Yes, I have. And is there, from a, a forensic science standpoint, in terms of crime scene identification, based upon your understanding of the evidence in this case, any reason for that? There's a, uh, is my understanding of it, yes, there's an explanation for what that. What is that? Well, in the case of the items that were collected from Bundy, that was the crime scene. We had two victims there and there were blood droplets that appeared to be inconsistent with having come from either of the victims. So they would indicate somebody else that had been present at that location. Uh, at that point, it makes sense to collect as much as possible of that, keeping in mind what I said before, if it had been extremely long, I would have expected them not to collect all of them. But uh, to collect a good representative sample of what we have there as far as the blood goes. As far as the other location at, at Rockingham, that was not a crime scene. It was a, another location that may or may not have been involved. And uh, they used a little bit more selectivity there, collecting a stain uh, at the beginning, at the end, and uh, leaving some of the ones in between in place. Your understanding is that there was no body or evidence that a crime actually occurred at that location? That's correct. Okay. Stain, phrase the question. Is it your understanding that there was no body or evidence that a crime actually was committed at that particular location? Homicide. Sustain. Oh, that's okay. I'll withdraw the question. Now, uh, did you also hear some evidence to the effect of a, tr uh, I'm not sure if it was triangular, but a little corner piece of paper that was in the area of um, <coughs> the entrance to the caged off area not having been collected? Yes, I have. And what is your view on that? I, as far as I'm concerned, if the I'm going to object to that question being voted. Sustained. Should that have been collected? Yes. And why? The area that we were talking about as far as this crime scene goes is a fairly limited in size and uh, not like, again, using an example, if uh, the, the crime had occurred in an alley where there was a lot of debris, a lot of trash around, then some selectivity uh, should have been done as far as collecting. You're not going to collect every bit of paper, every bit of trash that's in an alley. This particular area, though, was smaller. I would assume had some uh, maintenance done on it with some regularity, possibly cleaning up. Uh, a piece of paper in that location um, kind of stands out as being potentially involved somehow, and had the criminalist been aware of its existence, should have collected it. Okay. And could the, non, uh, could the failure to collect that item have in any way affected any of the other biological evidence, some of which you tested in this case? No, not in any way. Okay. Do, do we While they're looking for that, let me go on to <coughs> another topic, and then we'll come back to it. Does the uh, Los Angeles Police Department use plastic baggies or plastic bags for the purposes of uh, putting the wet swatches until they've had an opportunity to dry them? The, the plastic baggies are used to transport the evidence, yes, until they can be taken back to the laboratory, opened up, and allowed to dry. And how long has that procedure been used? Well, that's the one that I learned pushing 17 years ago, so it's been in use at least that long. 
And during the 13 or so years that you were involved in the serology, was, was that, is that right? Was, was it approximately 13? Uh, yes, approximately 13 years. Okay. What uh, effect, if any, did you observe on that collection technique, on the uh, evidence that you were actually testing? Well, considering it was the technique that was used and was the standard technique in our laboratory, and we would, with regularity, analyze evidence items that would give us good uh, typeable or identifiable results, I would have to say that, you know, that the use of that technique was appropriate and effective for bringing samples into the laboratory for analysis. And during the, the uh, 13 or so years that you were in serology, did you notice any particular problems in terms of evidence being degraded to the point where you couldn't get results? No, there is not an ongoing uh, problem at all with, with degradation uh, that I can relate back to the bags. Occasionally we would have a uh, piece of evidence come through that had been allowed to stay in the bag, and that's very inappropriate, and that would show us uh, problems with that evidence. Under but what circumstances would that happen? If the person forgot to take it out, if they were not properly trained, that would happen sometimes with the detectives. Uh, it just is a situation that would occur, though, very rarely. Sometimes when detectives were collecting some of the stains? Occasionally, but rarely. And in those instances where it was not taken out of the bag to dry for an extended period of, well, when you say extended, what do you mean? Well, I mean as far as ultimate packaging, where it, it then gets put onto a shelf and is left for, you know, anywhere from many days to, to months. You mean you would have situations like that <coughs> occasionally with where detectives? We'd, where we'd see a blood sample still left in a plastic bag? Yeah. Occasionally, but rarely. And what happened on those samples? Normally they were de degraded. You wouldn't get false results, you'd just get no results. What, what do you mean you wouldn't get false results? Well, except for a very unique or specific situation, degradation of a sample doesn't change the type to another type. It just makes it so you don't get any information at all. So when you say no information, when you do your test, what do you come up with? No result. No, there's, there's no typeable result that's obtained. In that particular instance, if the uh, perpetrator's blood has in fact been lifted from a crime scene or uh, a crime location and the results have been degraded to the point where you don't get any information, would that benefit fit the perpetrator? Sustain. Rephrase the question. Would that cause the perpetrator to be falsely included as a possible donor of the stain? No, it would not. Could it cause the perpetrator to be falsely excluded? No, there's no information there at all. It just wouldn't provide any uh, forensic information. Okay. Now, let me just uh, go back to this um, <coughs> photograph. I, I, I think I'd like to mark this photograph as People's 205 for identification of what appears to be the little piece of paper. I think it's depicted in some other photographs. <coughs> Is this your understanding of, of the uh, piece of paper? Yes, it is. Okay. Can we see that? All right. And is this piece of paper, you said that you would have collected if you'd been out at the crime scene? If I was aware that it was there, yes, that's one of the items. Assuming I would it hadn't been covered over by a blanket or some other item, and you'd seen it? If I'd seen it, yes. Um, now, is this the kind of thing where there's a hard and fast rule that you should collect it, or is this the kind of thing about which reasonable forensic scientists could differ? I mean, how would you characterize it? Well, when it comes to what to collect, there are very few hard and fast rules. That's what is acquired with experience. The, the mental 
picture of what you collect and what you don't collect. Uh, so as far as a hard and fast rule, whether or not somebody should collect it or, or told to collect it by a manual, no, that doesn't exist. And in your estimation, uh, Mr. Matheson, if this uh, particular piece of paper were located in an area where there was a fairly extensive pooling of the victim's blood, would this be the kind of evidence that you would want to test for biological evidence uh, showing the victim's blood type? I don't believe I would recommend this particular item to be tested for the biological evidence on it. Uh, particularly in light of other evidence that was collected. Okay. Thank you. Now, going back to the, the issue of uh, collecting, why would you not recommend that that be collected for, uh, tested for biological? Well, why would you recommend that that piece of biological evidence or the biological evidence on it not be tested further for genetic markers? Well, like I just mentioned, you have to look at the whole scene, and we do have uh, other items of biological evidence that provide uh, information as to what possibly occurred. This particular one being found in close proximity to the victim, being heavily blood-stained, uh, at some point we do have to make some assumptions, and the assumption would be that the blood that's present on that is coming from the victim uh, herself. At some point, if it really seemed necessary or if there was a lack of other evidence in the case, we may want to go after and analyze some of the individual drops, but uh, it would be a low priority when it comes to that. I just wanted to show one of the uh, overall photographs of the crime scene that's already been marked. <coughs> I guess this is a, a, it's a, a, a bloody photograph, but um, so the court might want to cut the the feed. Sir, showing you what's been previously marked as people's forty three D. In this area of the pooling of the blood, how much, if any, of that blood on the sidewalk, it's not a sidewalk, in this walkway should be tested? On that particular location, I, very little of that blood. I, it's, it is, Common sense does come into play when you're cho picking and choosing which items to analyze or which items to collect. And uh, common sense would tell you that by far, uh, if not all of the blood that's visible in that picture is coming from the victim herself. Uh, I would want at least one sample or item of that blood to be collected 
as a, a standard of the victim. But uh, And if the evidence showed that the piece of paper were found in what would be the uh, upper right-hand portion of the photograph, uh, would that location be consistent with the answer that you previously gave about why you would not want to test that necessarily for biological evidence? That would be the sustained. Is there anything about the photograph and the uh, placement of the object that would relate to your answer previously given as to testing the piece of paper for biological evidence? Well, given the location of that piece of paper and the way it's heavily stained, uh, I wouldn't say that we'd never test it, but it would be a very low priority. Now, getting back to the issue of collecting stains, uh, have you looked at the Los Angeles Police Department manual, specifically uh, section 52520, as to, as to booking of um, biological evidence? I, yes, I, yes, I have. I've looked at a number of manual references. I'd like to make sure that the one you're talking about is the one I'm thinking of. show this to refresh the witness's recollection. So showing you a section of the Los Angeles Police Department manual, do you recognize that? Yes, I do. And specifically 52520 talks about preserving wet stains. Yes. And it does that state in the second sentence that plastic containers or plastic wrap shall not be used as a packaging material? Yes, it does. And what is it your What is your understanding of that requirement? Well, the the operative term there is packaging. I uh, we teach and in consistency with the manual at that point say that uh, biological evidence should never be stored or packaged for permanent storage in plastic. Now, when you say packaging, final packaging, what are you talking about? When the items are submitted to our property division for storage until such time they're analyzed. OK, I'll get into that a little bit more later. So in terms of the usage of plastic bags, for transporting a stain from the scene to the laboratory when it's dried. Within the forensic science community and amongst serologists, is that one acceptable technique for collecting a stain? Yes, it is. Now, does the Los Angeles Police Department, let me just ask you another question about the manual first. Is this manual, the manual provisions dealing with the booking of evidence, are they up to date? No, they are not. In what manner are they not up to date? A uh, perfect example is, is we currently have within part of SID a property room that's called the Evidence Control Unit, and we have a courier system, which are light-duty officers that travel throughout the city at night collecting <coughs> evidence from the different stations and bringing them down to our Evidence Control Unit for final storage. Uh, both of these functions have been in existence for at least, oh, I believe, two to three years, one of them longer than that, and there is no reference to either one of them that I'm aware of in the manual. In other words, there's no reference to this new evidence control unit that you have at SID in the manual? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. And if the, uh, a piece of evidence is collected from a crime scene, biological evidence, in a manner that's forensically accepted, but the manual provisions have not been updated in such a way so as to authorize that particular collection, would it affect the outcome of the test? Well, first off, I'd rather they followed the proper procedure rather than following the manual. Okay. Uh, if, if that is the way that we're doing something, then it's better to use a procedure that's going to give you the best results than 
a reference in the manual that may be outdated. Now, with respect to the uh, crime scene truck, is there a refrigerator in the crime scene truck? Yes, there is. And <clears throat> what kind of materials are stored in the refrigerator? Mainly it's uh, chemicals, particularly chemicals that we use for field spot tests. Would there be any problems in storing biological evidence in the refrigerator? Any problem with it? Yeah. Uh, no, there isn't a lot of space, but uh, there wouldn't be a problem with it. What about spillage? Is there any issue concerning spillage of these chemicals onto the biological evidence? Well, ultimately, that could be a problem. I, but I, we don't have a lot of spillage in them, but we do carry chemicals in there. Now, is there any rule that you're supposed to use the refrigerator when you're collecting a stain? No, there is not. What about with respect to the whole blood? Uh, when whole blood is collected and a criminalist comes into possession of it, does that whole blood that's taken as a reference sample have some uh, preservative in it? Yes, it does. I'd just like to show you what's been previously marked as Defense Exhibit 11, 1111, 11, excuse me, 1112 and 1124. For identification to purple top tubes. Do you recognize those items? Yes, I do. What are they? They are two samples of two different brands of, of blood collection tubes. What's the significance of the purple tops? The color of the top of any tube indicates the preservative or anticoagulant that's present inside of the tube. Purple happens to uh, pertain to something that goes by the initials of EDTA. Do you use purple top tubes in the laboratory? Yes, we do. And uh, they, do they come from the manufacturer with the EDTA in them? Yes. What does it do? It, I, I'm not sure if it is just an anticoagulant or if it's an anticoagulant preservative, but it helps the blood to stay in such a condition that it's appropriate for typing. And is it critical if you have an EDTA purple top tube to refrigerate that uh, reference sample immediately? Not immediately. Okay. How long do, can you keep the uh, purple top tube out? Or, or should you keep it out before you refrigerate it? Well, I don't know if I know of any particular, you know, specific time frame I would like Personally, I would like it to get into a refrigerator as soon as it's possible. Uh, however, I do know that we get legitimate results if it's not placed in the refrigerator as soon as possible. So uh, I don't think I can give a specific time frame on that. What happens if you get a reference sample from a living victim or a living defendant? Uh, the defendant has to be living. Uh, and the activity from the tube is lost, genetic activity. Well, in that situation, it creates a little bit more paperwork, I'm sure, but the source of that blood is still available. We can get an additional two. Okay. All right, Mr. Goldberg, would this be a good spot? Uh, maybe I could just ask one more question right, to tie this up. Okay. And what is the effect, therefore, if the genetic activity is lost from one of these tubes? Well, if it is lost, then the information from that particular tube is no longer available to us. However, if we can get an additional sample from that individual, the results would be exactly the same as from the first tube. And what if you couldn't get an additional sample from the individual? Would you get a false inclusion as a result of a blood vial having degraded? No, you wouldn't get a result. There'd be nothing to compare the information from your uh, evidence items to compare it to. Similar to the case of a dried stain taken from a crime scene? It's a stain. Well, is that similar to the explanation that you previously gave, gave when we were discussing a stain taken from a crime scene? That's correct, in that if you lose the information, it just there isn't anything there to compare to. You do not make then erroneous comparisons, inclusions or exclusions. And in this particular case, were you able to test and get results from the reference sample that came from the defendant? Sustain. 
did you test the reference sample, in this case, item number 17? Objection. Sustained. I didn't hear grounds. Foundation. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll take it up. Maybe we can take it up. All right. The person whose uh, cellular telephone went off is ordered to immediately surrender that telephone. In this section of the courtroom. If I don't get a response from anybody, everybody's going to be searched coming in and out of the courtroom for the presence of cellular telephones and pagers. We've had enough problems with this. We've disrupted these proceedings six times already. I don't want to have to order the bailiffs to search each individual person. So the person with the cellular phone. There's purses were searched when they left. All right, bailiffs are ordered to search each individual entering the courtroom. No pagers, cellular telephones, any noise making devices may be allowed in the courtroom from this point hence. All right, we'll be in recess. One o'clock. It's a matter, all the parties are again present. Uh, Mr. Uh, Blazier, when we uh, recessed, you indicated that there was something about uh, we had one other issue, one of the boards that you had an objection to. Actually, now there are two issues, Judge. They just brought another board in. Um, <laughs> All right, well, let's take a look at the first board. Which board? Uh, the Figurino board. manner so it's yes
frame counter number 0039. This bears the frame counter 0040. No, I, I recognize the scene that's depicted there. All right, Mr. Uh, Goldberg, why yeah. do we need this? What? Why do we need this? The the reason is is that this goes back to the the uh, EAP issue. As the court recalls, the defense made a, a big deal in the opening statement about someone else's blood being found under Nicole Brown's fingernails, and we're going to address that in in, in some great detail. The court. I know that one of the things that we want to do in order to do that is to put on evidence as to the testing of item number 42, which is the blood underneath Nicole Simpson, uh, Nicole Brown. And what I want to be able to show here is why it was reasonable from a forensic science standpoint to make an inference about the results under the fingernails from the results on the pool of blood. I want to show that they are in contact, that she is lying in that area, and that the blood that Mr. Matheson testified, tested, item number 42, is subject to the same environmental conditions and was deposited on the crime scene at the same time, presumably, as the blood underneath the fingernails. So you're saying the relevance is the location and position of the hands? from whence the nail scraping Yeah, come from. in contact with the, the pool of blood. And then the, the relevance of the hands themselves, is the close-ups of the hands, which I, I believe may also be in evidence, according to, to Mr. Glacier, uh, is that they do the same thing. They're, they're showing that this is all really part of one contiguous and continuous blood source, and therefore we can take test results from a variety of locations in that source of blood under the fingernails and interrelate them and trying to figure out what's happening to the items underneath the fingernails. All right, Mr. Blazier, do you have any response to that? Just that the jury has seen these pictures over and over and over again. You can't even see item 42 in any of these pictures. I think it's irrelevant and cumulative and prejudicial. All right. The court finds that in this particular context, the location and position of the hands relative to the crime scene itself, the pool of blood, and the location of uh, Nicole Brown Simpson as she was found, uh, that there is significant probative value with regards to the nails, clippings, and scrapings, and that the jury has already seen a similar picture to this um, in a relevant context. I don't think it will have the inflammatory effect that uh, counsel argues, so the objection will be overruled. All right, what's the second board? There's a new chart that uh, just was brought down at 1 o'clock, I believe, and it concerns testing by the defense. And this is an issue that we've talked about a number of times before. We're waiting for a ruling from the court on uh, issues related to these items on this board, I believe. And we have 